Fallout, Darkest Hour. Chapter 2 At the brink of dawn, Annabelle makes her way through a patch of trees. She has been traveling all night trying to distance herself from the Viking clan that burned Holling's farm. Still covered from head to toe in Viking armor, the only parts of Annabelle showing are her blue eyes, cheeks, and chin from behind her horned helmet. Tired from sleep, she looks around in every direction, paranoia getting the better of her. Off in the distance, she sees the glow of a fire in an opening. As she gets closer, she discovers it's a small farm. A hand-built wooden shack in a clearing within the woods, a mixture of carrots and potatoes growing in the dirt. She doesn't see any farmers nearby, but she does spot a gun and a bottle of clean water on a circular metal table. Without any supplies, she has no choice. Just ask. They wouldn't let someone die. Annabelle slowly makes her way towards the table. As she gets closer to the farm, she sees a few tin cans as a makeshift alarm near the door. The door is hand-painted red, with three different size handprints in yellow. Next to the door is a rifle leaning against the wall, with marks going up the wall. The marks have numbers next to them. The higher the marks go, the number increases, stopping at 10. As Annabelle arrives at the table, she quickly grabs the water and starts drinking. <sighs> Annabelle turns toward the open door to see a child wrapped up in an oversized red coat, completely motionless. His pale eyes are wide open, fixed on her from behind the cans. They both remain fixed to the ground, waiting for the other to move first. I... I need food and water. Dad! The child's father comes out of the door hastily dressed and sees a Viking with their water. Wanting to defend his land and protect his family, he glances towards the rifle before trying to grab it. Annabelle instinctively grabs the pistol on the table and points it at them. The father freezes on the spot, inches from his rifle. Please, which clan are you a part of? Yellow and blue, you're not a part of Sky Clan. We pay them caps weekly. You steal from us, they'll destroy your clan to the ground. Tired from lack of sleep, Annabelle completely blanks everything he says, her eyelids getting heavier by the second. I need food and water. Not everything. Just... <sighs> sure thing. I can get you that. Annabelle's eyes slowly start closing as she begins to drift off. Annabelle's finger accidentally twitches, pulling the trigger. Her eyes spring open with everything blurred. The shapes start to form, and Annabelle sees the father holding the child in his arms. She slowly realizes his red coat has a different shade of wet red growing from his chest. The mother comes to the doorway upon the gunshot and moves straight to her dying child. Annabelle sees the child cough up blood just before he dies. She drops the gun and retreats back into the woods. Edward leads his group down a ruined street, having escaped ghost. At midday, the sun is high in the blue sky sunny but with grey clouds. The street is mostly intact, the odd car rusting away, the odd piece of litter here and there, but otherwise clean. Shops run along both sides of the street. Every window has been smashed in. One has been blown to pieces, the burnt wood containing bullet holes from a shootout long forgotten. The sign discarded on the street, burnt away but barely able to read, Joe's off license. Edward is at the front limping, a bandage with dried blood is wrapped around his right thigh over his worn black trousers. Following him is Billy. She's wearing welding overalls, too big for her, on top of a mustard yellow top. She has a blue backpack, full of supplies, matching her hoodie. Next to Billy is Alice, who has a Pip-Boy on her left wrist over her green leather jacket. Bradley walks next to Grace, hugging her with every step. Grace's head rests against Bradley's green cargo vest the gun holster on his right leg, empty. Assistance is at the back of the group, sensors scanning. No enemies detected. That's good, assistance. Keep watch for us. I will keep my long-range sensors running. Never mind the raiders. Where the fuck are we going, Edward? Forward. That's where we're heading. <laughs> That's just another way of saying you don't know. You just need to have faith. We wouldn't have escaped just to die on the road. It's not like we have any other choice. Further away from the Vikings, the better. No other choice? You said once we got weapons, we'll go back for Olivia. They would have sent scouts out ahead of their main force trying to track us. How about 
We ambush the scouts, take their weapons, and return to save my daughter. Bradley, Grace, I'm sorry to tell you this, but Olivia's gone. There's nothing back there for us. You don't know that. Ghost said I would wish he killed her, which means she's still alive. Trust me, Bradley. She's not. Hours ago, in the middle of the night, when the group was still captured by the Ghost Clan, Bradley looks down in horror having chosen a daughter for Ghost to take, his long, wild hair hiding his face. The door slowly opens, and Edward comes limping in. His right thigh has a fresh bandage around his stab wound. A massive grin appears on his face, and he holds up five bobby pins. Happened for a reason. Edward makes his way over to Billy and starts to pick the lock on her chains. Even with the chains on, Billy still has a fingerless glove on her left hand. Almost got it. Ah, oh, there we go. Free from her chains, Billy rubs her wrists. Thanks, Edward. Billy, I need you to get us supplies. From inside the factory? Vikings are asleep. You just need to stay quiet. Can you do that? Yeah, of course I can do that. Try and get Alice's pit boy back. We're going to need assistance. Oh, take these. Edward holds two of the five bobby pins. Good luck. Thanks. Billy leaves Edward to continue freeing the others. Once outside the door, she walks up the stairs and goes through the following door. She arrives on a walkway overlooking the factory floor. On the ground floor are countless Vikings all asleep inside various mattresses and sleeping bags. Different workstations are scattered around the place. Billy spends a minute in silence studying the sleeping Vikings before continuing along the walkway. She discovers a room labeled cleanup. She tries opening the door, but unfortunately it's locked. Billy takes one of the bobby pins and tries to unlock the door. Damn. The bobby pin snaps, forcing Billy to use the last one. She manages to unlock the room. The door swings open, revealing a makeshift hospital. Billy grabs a nearby blue backpack and starts taking anything she thinks might be useful. You never know. On the desk is a scalpel which she leaves, first checking the drawer to find a 10mm pistol and four bullets. She packs that inside her bag and picks up the scalpel before leaving the room. Billy continues along the walkway, rather than going down the stairs to the ground floor. She cracks the door at the end open and listens. Upon hearing nothing, Billy enters the corridor and makes her way down. Outside a door, she finds one of Olivia's cowboy boots. She tries the door but finds it locked. She grips the scalpel and quietly knocks on the door, waiting for a reply. When no one answers, she uses the bobby pin and unlocks the door. Billy opens the door slowly to see Olivia curled up on a mattress with her back to the door. Billy makes her way over. Olivia, it's me. As Billy gets closer to Olivia, she notices in one hand she also has a scalpel. Billy looks at Olivia's other wrist to see fresh blood flowing onto the mattress. Looking at her face, Olivia is beyond saving. Billy closes Olivia's eyes before leaving the room and closing the door. Billy moves further down the corridor until she sees a glow of a terminal coming from one of the rooms. She enters the room and finds Alice's Pip-Boy next to a terminal on the desk against the wall. The room is mostly bare, apart from the desk and a single bed in the corner. Must be Ghost's office. Billy sits down at the desk and starts searching the terminal, only to find it locked. She looks inside a drawer to discover four hollow discs, which she decides to take. Back in the room, Edward has unchained his group, and they're waiting for Billy to return. Billy enters through the door with her blue backpack on, scalpel in her right hand, Pip-Boy in the left. How'd it go? Got supplies and the Pip-Boy. Alice, can you get assistance on? I can do that. Alice takes the Pip-Boy without making eye contact. She puts it on her left arm, connects it up to assistance, and starts tapping away. Edward, I've got something for you. Billy leads Edward outside the room for privacy. They stand on the other side of the door, at the bottom of the stairs. I found Olivia. Oh God, what did they do? Nothing. They locked her in a room. She found a scalpel and took the easy way out. We can't tell him. He'll just go on a suicide mission, getting us all killed. He's still got Grace. I'll handle this. One last thing. Billy reaches into her bag and pulls out the 10mm pistol. Only four bullets, but better than nothing. You should be the one to have it. You sure? Grace and me are too young. Alice won't use it, and I don't trust Bradley. He's... he's going through some stuff. We should give him time before we judge him. What about me? What do you think about me? 
Edward gets down on one knee to look directly into Billy's blue eyes and places his right hand on her shoulder. I think, if it wasn't for you, we'd all be dead. System online. The rest of the group join Edward and Billy at the base of the stairs. Now we find Olivia. No. What do you mean, no? We can't leave her. All we have is this gun with four bullets. You want to take out an entire clan? We escape, we resupply, and then we rescue Olivia. Okay, but promise me, we'll come back for her? I promise. You fucking promised me we'll rescue her! Back on the street, Bradley is in Edward's face, his anger seething out. I promised we'll go back for her. Once we resupply, if you want to go back for her body, I will be the first person to join you. Right now, we need to focus on Olivia. How do you know she's dead? Did you find her before you rescued us? We could have taken her with us, you fucking bastard. I found her. It wasn't Edward's fault. If I could take her with me, I would have. You two fucking lied to me. What else have you been hiding? Dad, please. Don't dad me. Your sister's dead. Bradley turns his full attention back to Edward, grabbing his red jacket. You're meant to be the leader. We're being picked off like flies here. There's six of us now. Last night, seven. A few days ago, we were 15. At the docks, we were 50 strong. How long before we're all gone? Bradley, you have every right to be angry. At Morton Docks, I tried to save as many as I could. Us six were meant to survive. You just need some faith. Ghost, we found him. Shirt to kill. As the shooting starts, the group scatters, avoiding the slaughter. Ghost, fully dressed in armor, leads a small group of Vikings towards his escaped prisoners. This way, follow me. Edward makes his way inside a ruined building. The place used to be a coffee shop. Outside, metal tables and chairs lay scattered about. Inside, very few tables and chairs remain. By the destroyed window, booths are fixed in place but destroyed. Some burnt. Some have the leather ripped out. Edward hides behind one of the booths for cover, while still having a clear shot through the smashed window. Bradley and Billy lay on the tiled floor, under and next to the overturned table and chairs. Alice takes cover behind the counter. Coffee cups remain littered on the floor. Assistant stands next to the entrance out of sight. Bradley instinctively reaches for his gun holster, only to find it empty. He begins looking around the coffee shop. Grace, where's Grace? The human child is 23 meters northeast. What? Under the red car. The group look out onto the street to see Grace silently crying underneath a rusted red car. Grace! Assistance, save Bradley. Bradley tries to run out of the door, but assistance grabs him and holds him back behind cover, locking its metal arms around Bradley's torso. Let go of me. I need to save my daughter. Releasing you will result in your death. My programming prevents me from obeying your orders. Fucking robot. Edward! I'm saving your life. A Viking tries charging towards the door, spear and shield in hand. Edward aims his gun and fires. Ah! The bullet hits the Viking in the chest, taking him out. Three. Assistants, how many Vikings are there? Twelve hostiles nearby. Fuck. The Vikings start surrounding the entrance of the store while holding shields out to avoid any more bullets. Ghost has been paying attention to Bradley's screams and works out what's happened. He looks under the red car and makes eye contact with Grace. It's a pleasure to meet you again. Still restrained by assistance, Bradley stretches his neck, trying to see Grace. Outside, in clear view, Ghost is holding Grace with a gun to her head. Everyone remains frozen. Alice hides behind the counter. Billy watches from the floor. Edward looks out from behind the booth, knowing what happens next. Grace's body collapses onto the floor. No! Upon hearing the gunshot, Alice panics, starts looking around to see a robot. A server truck. No legs, just the upper body on a pole that moves along a rail behind the counter providing service. Now it lies at the far end of the counter, snapped off the rail, gathering dust as it's shut down. Alice crawls across the floor towards the robot and connects her Pip-Boy up to the Servotron. Edward stands up in front of the window and with his arms stretched out, starts shooting at Ghost, hoping to get a hit. After the first gunshot is fired, Ghost ducks and hides behind the car. Out of bullets, Edward hides back behind the booth, his back against the red leather. I'm out. 
Edward's right hand rubs his ginger goatee, trying to think of what to do next. Billy looks over and sees Alice trying to hack the robot. She crawls over to find out what she's doing. Are you able to get it working? Help fight them? It can't fight. I can access the self-destruct, though. What about us? Back door. Billy looks towards the back of the shop to see a doorway. The door missing, but leading out into another street. She crawls back over towards Edward, who's still trying to think of a solution. Alice has a robot which she can self-destruct, and the store has a back door. A smile breaks out on Edward's face. Let's go. Bradley, we need to escape out the back door. I'm not leaving Grace's body behind. Not again. Assistance, knock him out. Affirmative. Assistance places its hand on Bradley's neck, shocking him until he's knocked out. Ah! What did it do? Small electronic shock, making the subject unconscious. Assistance, carry Bradley for us. Come on, Billy. Assistance carries Bradley's slumped body in its arms as it moves towards the back of the store. Billy, Assistance, and Bradley leave the store while Edward stays with Alice. Is the self-destruct ready? Just need to press the button. Do it and run. Alice confirms the self-destruct, detaches her pit boy and runs out of the back door, arms wrapped around her green jacket. The Servotron springs to life, and the hum from the self-destruct grows. Well, it's a pleasure to meet you, sir, madam, child, or other. May I say it is a pleasure that you choose to support Catherine's Cafe. We are grateful for your custom. Now, how may I serve you? Edward calls out, confronting Ghost. What's the matter, Ghost? Who's scared to take us on? Edward leaves out of the back door as the robot continues to build up a charge. Oh, I am sorry you have decided to shop elsewhere. If you would be so kind as to fill out this short 42-page survey about your experience, we we'll always try to improve. Next customer. Storm the police. Yeah, right. All right, boss. The Vikings start charging the store with their shields raised to block any attacks. As they get near the store, the robot self-destructs, capturing a handful of Vikings in its blast. Yeah, top quality. Ghost looks at the destruction from behind the car. The entire store is gone, blown to pieces. Half of each neighboring store has also been destroyed. Ghost makes his way over to the Vikings who were outside the radius. He drags one of them to their feet. Search the building. I want it back. But the blast! There'll be radiation! Ghost pulls out a knife and stabs the Viking in the side of his neck. As the knife exit, blood starts shooting out of the wound. The Viking falls to the floor, and Ghost makes his way over to the next closest Viking. Search the building. I want it back. Sh sh sure thing. Come on, you maggots. The Vikings make their way into the radiated building, fires still burning, to start searching the rubble. Ghost makes his way over to Grace's body. He sits on the tarmac cross-legged and strokes her black hair. His empty gray eyes look at the fresh blood staining her blouse before turning to her unmoving blue eyes behind her glasses. I'm sorry you got dragged into this. As the sun begins to set, Annabelle arrives at a radio tower on top of a hill. A wire fence surrounds the base of the tower. The hill is completely bare except for a small withered tree. Exhausted, Annabelle collapses onto the ground resting against the tree, still in her Viking armor. Help me. Annabelle's eyes start to weigh on her slowly closing as she falls straight to sleep. The top branch of the tree begins to bend down. On the end of the branch is a big juicy apple dangling in front of Annabelle's face. Annabelle's eyes slowly open, seeing the blurry apple she uses the last of her strength to reach out. As she's about to grab it, the ground beneath her begins to crack. <coughs> no! Inside the cracks, Annabelle is able to see scales made of bark. She jumps up and tries to escape as a massive serpent erupts from the earth. Its massive jaw snapping away, trying to swallow Annabelle whole. As the serpent starts coming out of the ground, the tree starts getting pulled into the ground. Annabelle manages to avoid the tree serpent's jaws. From out of nowhere, a feral ghoul tries to attack Annabelle, who manages to dodge out of the way. Missing its target, the feral ghoul hits the ground. It tries getting back up, but the tree serpent grabs its feet and starts trying to swallow it whole. The feral ghoul tries resisting, but it's too late. More feral ghouls arrive and notice Annabelle. There's a slight pause before Annabelle starts to flee, and the feral ghouls follow as the sun quickly sets. Feral ghouls. Uh, the, the more hated cousin of the ghoul. Uh, let's be honest, we, we all hate them. Uh, the feral ones, not the, uh, not the, not the normal ones. 
best best to make that clear. Don't wanna don't wanna start losing fans. Uh, one of one of my runners. Uh, this this time not Frederick. Here, his name is Bark. Although he could have said Mark. It, it's hard to tell with that raspy voice. <laughs> I'm I'm not doing myself any favors. Uh, feral ghouls. Best way to to make them out is to take them out is to to aim for their legs, uh, arms. Uh, basically limbs uh, prevent them from moving and you know swiping at you and, and you can step in and, and finish them off uh, it's, it's easy once you know how never done it myself uh, as long as you've got a weapon I mean <laughs> who, tra who travels the wasteland without a weapon if um, if if you're someone who hasn't got a weapon then uh, then th this this song should help keep your spirits up from from America, I present Wasteland Spirit. Living in this wasteland, I just can't catch a break. Raiders and super mutants putting my life at stake. They came to my homestead and pillaged up my farm. They tried to take my baby girl, so I caused them some harm. We got wasteland troubles, affects us one and all. We got wasteland troubles, they try to make us fall. But there's one thing that I think that they forgot. We got that wasteland spirit, the one thing they do not. Edward and what's left of his group enters a small rundown house. The house is one of a few that are placed on top of a small hill. The road leads up with houses on one side and nature on the other. Inside the house, Edward looks around the ground floor. An open room with a kitchen to one side and a cooking station in the middle. The room is almost empty. An old sofa opposite a smashed in television with a rug between the two. Three paint cans form a pyramid in the corner of the room. Stairs located next to the front door and a back door leading to a garden. Billy quickly runs up to the radio and turns it off. Good work, Billy. Little noise as possible. We'll rest here tonight. I'll go check upstairs. Rest here? The sun is setting. We've still got time. Two and a half minutes. Yeah, two and a half. Not much, but shouldn't we keep going? We can see in the dark. We have no idea where we are. I want to have a secure place to spend the night. Best to rest here and wait until morning. So let me check the house first. Edward goes upstairs, leaving the others in the living room. Bradley sits on the old sofa and places his head in his hands, fingers hidden in his coal black hair. Alice sits on the floor, back against the wall with both doors in view. She holds her knees to her chest. Assistance remains motionless, fixed in the middle of the room. Billy places her backpack down on the floor and makes her way over to close the front door. Bradley, I'm sorry. Don't. Don't you dare talk about them. After closing the door, Billy makes her way across the room and sits next to Alice. That was a good idea with the robot. Self-destruct. Thanks. You're good at hacking. It seems like a good skill to have. Maybe you could teach me. I've got a magazine called Total Hack You Can Read. Um, yeah. Reading a magazine would be good. Edward comes down the stairs. All clear upstairs. Single room with a bed, and someone left a sleeping bag behind. We can get some sleep up there. Edward looks out of the window to see the sun getting closer to the horizon, his right hand rubbing the back of his head. It'll be night soon. We need someone on watch. I'll do it. You don't have to. I could- Both my daughters are dead. I won't be getting any sleep tonight. You can take first watch. When you get tired, wake me up, and I'll take over. I don't mind sharing the bed with Alice. Then you could take the sleeping bag. Alice doesn't like to share a bed. I need my personal space. I don't like having people close to me. Oh, uh, sure. You can have the bed, Alice. Billy, you can have the sleeping bag. I'll sleep on the sofa. Here. I'll keep a watch from the kitchen. Bradley gets off the sofa and goes over to the kitchen. He sits down at the table and looks out the kitchen window with a clear view of the street. Alice and Billy head upstairs while Edward lies down and falls asleep on the sofa. Bradley keeps watch, looking out of the kitchen window as time slowly ticks on. We could defect. Find another clan. Upon hearing the voice, Bradley makes his way to the front door and looks out of the letterbox. Outside, walking along the road are two Vikings, both carrying spears and a shield of red and black, the colors of the Saxon clan. Why would another clan take us? Why wouldn't they? We would have defected from a clan. They would have no reason to trust us. Even if we leave, we would either be a clan of two or we'll have to work hard to survive. I don't want to work hard. No better than a settler. Why go for all that only to have it stolen? 
Might as well steal it yourself. The two Vikings walk past the house unaware of the people inside. Once they're gone, Bradley places his hand on the doorknob and pauses. He turns the handle, opens the door, but turns around to see assistants in the corner of the room watching him. Bradley walks over to assistants. If anyone asks where I am, just tell them I've gone to the toilet. I might be some time. Understand? Affirmative. Bradley leaves the house and walks onto the road. He bends down to pick up a large rock and follows the Vikings. Down the road, one of the Vikings comes stumbling from a nearby tree, buckling up his belt. As he gets closer towards the road, he spots the other Viking knocked out on the floor. Bradley emerges from out of the shadows, rock in hand, and smashes it across the Viking's head. The Viking collapses on top of the other Viking, both knocked out, unable to defend themselves. Now we begin. The first Viking slowly wakes up to find themselves and the other Viking propped up against a tree. He looks down to see his hands bound by a belt. In front of him is a roaring fire, and sitting on the other side is Bradley. The glow from the fire lights up the underside of his face, giving him an almost demonic look. You're called Vikings, right? That's right. Vikings are just groups of people who go around raiding from others? You have to survive somehow. And where I'm from, we call them raiders. Scum of the earth. I was never one of them. I was a part of the group that had structure, a chain of command. We had a goal, a purpose. I was a gunner. At night, Gilbert continues walking down a broken street. Cars left to rust, completely lost in thought. His old trench coat filled with so many holes, it's almost rotted away. Gilbert takes off his aviator hat to scratch his head before putting it back on. He looks off to the right and spots something. Putting his binoculars to his eyes, he sees a teddy bear underneath a massive oak tree. Hmm, what's this? Gilbert makes his way over to the teddy bear and picks it up. You look familiar. Have we met before? No! From underneath Gilbert's feet, a rope gets pulled, tightening around his ankles. The rope pulls Gilbert upside down, swinging by his feet from the oak tree. His backpack of junk falls to the ground, and several items roll out. In his right hand, he continues holding the teddy bear. Two super mutants come out from hiding places around the trap. One continues holding the rope, while the other makes their way over to Gilbert. Prize! We have a prize! <laughs> Puny ghoul fell for our trap. Tooth will like you. Gilbert brings the teddy bear up to his face. Was you a part of this? Annabelle runs through the trees, not paying attention to where she's going. The only thing on her mind is escaping the feral ghouls and tree serpent. As she exits the tree line, she doesn't notice the cliff until she's already falling. She hits the water and gets submerged, unable to tell which way's up. The feral ghouls continue after her jump off the cliff without thinking, trying to capture their prey. With the weight of the armor pulling her down, she begins ripping the Viking armor off. Each piece sinks to the bottom of the lake to rust and be forgotten. Without the armor, Annabelle makes it to the surface. Swimming with her eyes closed, Annabelle finally makes it to the shore, the water washing her clean. Annabelle collapses in the mud, keeping her eyes closed, too tired to continue fighting. Save me. Annabelle slowly opens her eyes to see a border collie attacking the feral ghouls. As one gets close to Annabelle, the dog jumps between them, saving her. Once all the feral ghouls are dead, the border collie walks over to Annabelle, licks dirt off her right cheek, and runs off. Annabelle looks up to see a red rocket station near the lake. She slowly picks herself off the ground and follows the border collie. Hi, it's Buddy again. Um, so, uh, thanks, thanks for watching. If you enjoy our content, then uh, consider supporting us through Patreon. Uh, where you can get a bunch of rewards and cool stuff and keep up to date with what's going on. And don't forget to follow and subscribe on Facebook and YouTube and Twitter for all of our future content. And uh, just to let you know, this was performed by a group of amazing voice actors, not including me. And all of the links are in the descriptions below. And we'll see you next time. Cheers. <laughs>
living in this wasteland, I just can't catch a break. Raiders and super mutants put my life at stake. They came to my homestead and pillaged up my farm. They tried to take my baby girl, so I caused them some harm. We got wasteland troubles, affects us one and all. We got wasteland troubles, they try to make us fall. But there's one thing that I think that they forgot. We got that wasteland spirit, the one thing they do not. A good old friend of mine was walking in a town and Then the brotherhood ordered him to bow When he refused, they grabbed him by his coat Pulled out their pistols and shot him in the throat He had wasteland troubles, he refused to bend He had wasteland troubles, so they broke him in the end But there's one thing that the brotherhood forgot He had the wasteland spirit The thing that they do not There was this crook locked up in a jail Didn't have no family or friends to post his bail A thug started a riot and killed a couple guards The crook picked up a set of keys and ran right out the yard He had wasteland troubles, he didn't do no wrong He had wasteland troubles, he'd been in there way too long And all those guards who unfortunately were shot And lost their wasteland spirit Something he still got We got a wasteland spirit and us one and all we got wasteland spirit and we won't ever fall but if you feel that your struggles are for not you got that wasteland spirit and don't you ever forget that <laughs>